If you're anything like me, you've got at least one container laying around that looks like this one. The good old bolt bucket. The last resort to dig into when assembling something and just one number six screw short of finishing it up. So a while back, I decided to see if I could cook something up to help me tame the bucket. Enter my little bolt sorting sieve. The idea was based on a particle sorting sieve, which are used for things like sorting of metal powders used in metal additive manufacturing. They feature a series of stacked screens, each with an array of holes with the hole sizes getting smaller and smaller the further down the stack you go. So it can be thought of as kind of a stack of greater than or equal to passages. And the bolt sorting sieve works much the same. Each layer of the bolt sorter has holes sized based on the head diameter of that type of fastener. For example, the standard socket head cap M5 fastener has a minimum head diameter of 8.3 millimeters, while a button head cap M4 has a maximum diameter of 7.6. So an array of 8 millimeter holes would catch all your M5s while letting M4s pass on through. For a particle sorter, the stack of screens sit atop a vibration table that helps the smaller particles work their way down through the system. This is mainly to help break the friction between the particles, but in the bolt sorter, the fasteners also need to find themselves in a vertical orientation to pass through the screens. And this is accomplished by giving it a good shake. The screens are stacked from smallest to largest, the mix of fasteners is tossed in the top, the lid gets popped on, and then it just gets shaken like a cocktail. And overall, I really like this little guy but it's that little qualifier that's the main reason we're here today. I love that it fits in the toolbox and doubles as a stackable storage container, but look at the size of that damn bucket. Ain't nobody got time for that. So I decided to try my hand at a larger version that's a bit closer to the original inspiration. Say hello to my first attempt at a benchtop bolt sorter. Functions on the same core concept as the original, but there are a couple of design decisions for the original that just weren't going to scale up well. For example, when it was cocktail shaker sized, this made sense, but as it gets larger, the shaker approach gets a bit ergonomically challenged. So I decided to go for a shaker motion on this one that more closely resembles that of its particle sorting cousins, shaking the screens back and forth. Unfortunately, as I'll dive into here shortly, that decision may not have been ideal. But first, let's take a look at the design and how it works, starting with the screens. The screens function like drawers sliding in and out along these V-groove channels on either side and these features around the perimeter fit closely against the mating features in the housing to avoid fasteners getting caught in the nooks and crannies. And there are built-in handles here on the front for easy opening and closing. So okay, let me address the elephant in the room. This print is ugly. I know. Clearly I'm due for some printer tuning. Or, even better, I should have left it to the pros and sent these files off to PCBWay, the sponsor of this video. PCBWay offers all kinds of options for getting your parts made, from 3D printing to CNC machining and even injection molding. And of course, any kind of PCB you can dream up. And right now, PCBWay is celebrating their 10 year anniversary by offering all kinds of coupons and special offers. So if you want to build a bolt sorter of your own, but don't want it to look chewed on, like mine, check out the link down below and take advantage of PCBWay's awesome range of options and impressively low prices. Huge thanks to PCBWay for supporting my channel. And let's get back to bolt sorting. I wanted the layers to swing back and forth, but I also wanted the assembly to be somewhat modular to allow for easily adding more layers over time if I so desired. I'm not sure how many layers my little shaker train could realistically handle, but let's take a closer look at how it works, and you can let me know your best guess. Taking a look at a single layer, you can see the pivot arms with the dowel pins sticking up. By pushing the dowels back and forth, the pivot arms rotate and slings our sieve screen back and forth. There are frame sections on either side of the sieve, supporting three pivot points per level. There are two pivots on the longer frame section here, and one pivot on the shorter frame section. And on each of these pivots are the little fork looking pivot arms. More on the forkiness in a bit. The non-fork end of the arm has a pivot point that attaches to the screen housing. So the combination of the four pivots here on the long side essentially makes a four bar linkage like this. The short side has the same pivot, but just a single. Taking a look inside, we can see that I decided to have a little fun with them. Instead of going with a shaft and radial bearings of some sort, I decided to try out a stacking of jewel bearings. If you haven't come across jewel bearings before, they're most commonly found in watchmaking and are made up of the end of a rotating shaft sitting in a jewel cup of something hard like a ruby or sapphire. They serve as both a radial and thrust bearing combined, and the hard materials and small contact patch make for low friction, dimensionally stable bearing. My 3D printed cups certainly don't offer all the same benefits of their fancy cousins, but the cones set a determined location for the center of the spherical ball that sits in them. So in this stack up, the cones in the housing and bracket are rigidly fixed relative to each other from the fastened joints. Each of these cones sets the center location for the ball that sits in them. As a result, the conical pockets in the pivot arm have only one possible position between the two balls. There's one degree of freedom that is over constrained, and that's along the axis of rotation of the joint. However, this axis is also parallel to the axis of the fasteners, 
so this over constraint was used for a preload of the bearing. I used the compliance of the plastic parts to provide a spring force for the preload through the assembly, but this could, and probably should, be done with a more predictable spring, like a Belleville spring or a wave spring or something under the fastener head. So now that I've blabbed on and on about these pivots, how do the fork tine looking things factor in? Well, these are what transfer motion from one layer to the next. The dowels sit on either side of the ball in the pivot on the layer above, so the motion of each layer is coupled to the motion of its neighbors. The goal of this method of transferring motion was to make the assembly modular and allow for easily adding layers without making any modification to the existing levels. Now let's take a look at what's providing that motion. The motor assembly bolts onto the long side frame in place of where the next level would attach. The motor spins this hub that has a pin offset radially by 10 millimeters, and that pin rides in a slot in the slider. So as the motor spins, the pin pushes the slider back and forth, oscillating a total of about 20 millimeters, or a little under an inch. The motion of the slider is constrained to a single degree of freedom by riding on these 5 millimeter dowels that are attached on either side of the motor mount and it engages the dowels on the pivot arms, similar to how the balls of a screen layer above would, but with printed cylindrical features instead of steel spheres. While I was pretty pleased with how my little shaker stack worked as intended, it turns out my intentions weren't quite right sized for the task at hand. Running the shaker off a DC motor with a no load speed of 120 RPM just doesn't give nearly enough shaking action to get the fasteners into that vertical orientation I mentioned earlier. As a result, dumping in my bucket o fasteners resulted in the vast majority of them just sitting in a pile on the top level of the sieve. Although I could just up the size and speed of the motor to get some more aggressive oscillation, I don't think the existing motion components are sized appropriately for the large increase in forces that'd be needed. So unfortunately, I'm thinking a trip back to the drawing board is going to be needed for the benchtop bolt sorter before it clears the bar set for me by its little buddy. But while version 1 of the benchtop bolt sorter fell short of my expectations, I feel like it's got some fun aspects worth sharing. If you've got any ideas for where this type of motion train could get the job done, or if you have any suggestions on how I could get this bolt sorter to better sort some bolts, let me hear them in the comments. I'll include a link to the build details in the description, along with a link to the printed part files and all that fun stuff. If you want to help me make more videos like this, I'd love to have your support as a member of the channel, and a huge thanks to PCBWave for their support in sponsoring this video. Thanks for watching, and hope you're building something fun.